Illusionism as a Theory of Consciousness by Keith Frankish In the movie The Matrix, Morpheus offers Neo a red pill. If he takes it, he will discover that reality as he knows it is an illusion created by machine overlords to keep humans in state. I'm going to offer you a different pill, which, if it works, will convince you that your own consciousness is a sort of illusion, a fiction created by your brain to help you keep track of his activities. This is illusionism. In another paper, The Consciousness Illusion, this is how Frankish introduces the idea of illusionism. Illusionism is the idea that phenomenal consciousness is an illusion. In his paper, Illusionism as a Theory of Consciousness, Frankish is going to try to explain from the ideas of Chalmers that it only seems to exist. Although there is a large amount of philosophical theories devoted to the idea of illusionism, it still remains a minority view, especially as many philosophers resist to take consciousness seriously. Especially with papers like Dennett's titled Illusionism as the Obvious Default Theory of Consciousness. This may not be surprising, although Dennett supports the thesis. Frankish identifies three approaches to phenomenal consciousness. The first is accepting that phenomenal consciousness exists. The second, we could argue that although the phenomenon is real, it is not in fact anomalous and can be explained with current science. The first two options are realist ones. Third, we could argue that the phenomenon is illusory and set out investigating how the illusion is produced. This third option is an illusionist one. We deny that the phenomenon is real and focus on explaining the appearance of it. So, illusionism about phenomenal consciousness is the idea that phenomenal consciousness does not exist even though it seems to exist. People usually mistakenly believe that they are phenomenal consciousness, but this is because they are victims of an illusion, the illusion of phenomenality. Illusionists agree with other physicalists that our sense of phenomenal consciousness is due to introspective mechanisms, but these mechanisms misrepresent their targets. Frankish, in The Consciousness Illusion, says, think of watching a movie. What your eyes are actually witnessing is a series of still images rapidly succeeding each other. But your visual system represents these images as a single fluid moving image. The motion is illusion. Similarly, illusionists argue your introspective system misrepresents complex patterns of brain activity as simple phenomenal properties. The phenomenality is an illusion. Frankish claims that a conscious experience has a subjective aspect, that objects with phenomenal properties, feels or character are phenomenally conscious. Radical realism accepts that phenomenal consciousness is real and incomprehensible and typically stresses the anomalousness of phenomenal properties, whereas conservative realism accepts the reality of phenomenal consciousness but tries to explain it in physical terms. Illusionism pairs the ideas with the juxtaposition of radical realism's stress on the anomalousness of phenomenal consciousness and conservative realism's dismissal of radical theoretical innovation. Illusionists deny that experiences have phenomenal properties and focus on explaining why they seem to have them. Frankish claims that we are introspectively aware of our sensory states but argues that this awareness is partial and distorted leading us to misrepresent the states as having phenomenal properties. So therefore, phenomenal consciousness is illusory. Experiences do not have qualitative properties. There are two types of illusionisms, weak and strong. Weak illusionism maintains that the properties are phenomenal, but in an illusion. And strong illusionism denies that there are qualitative, that it is in an illusion to think that phenomenal properties even exist. Frankish goes on to offer a number of illusionist philosophers' analogies to show these different types, where they're explaining their interpretation of illusionism, that introspection provides a partial distorted view of our experiences, that complex physical features are simple phenomenal ones. Frankish has aimed to semi-defend or more explain the theory of illusionism. His paper attempts to substitute the question, what is phenomenal experience, with why people have the illusion of a phenomenal experience. Then it uses the phrase, what qualia? There are a number of responses to Frankish. Evidently, as it is more of a minority theory, they are mostly criticisms. I will briefly outline some of the predominant criticisms and go into more detail with Kramer's response defending illusionism. Typically, a skeptic will maintain that phenomenalism can't be specified meaningfully. But if this is true, then it contradicts itself. 
how can we begin to talk about it? Ned Block makes a strong claim. He says some people want to cast anything that they don't know as an illusion. He disputes the idea by claiming how is it that the neural basis of conscious experience is the neural basis of that experience, as opposed to other experience or no experience at all, which is a problem we do not know the answer to, the problem which Frankis is attempting to answer with illusionism. Bloch says that perhaps an even trickier problem would be that of other minds. How could we tell if another creature was conscious, especially if that creature is made from a completely different form and material form from ourselves? Even these problems wouldn't make us think that consciousness wouldn't exist. Philip Goff too is renowned for disputing the theory and is perhaps one of its toughest critics. He opens his ideas with, you need consciousness to actually have an illusion, which makes it straightforward contradictory. These ideas are what Chalmers described as not taking the theory seriously. Goff, unlike Bloch, however, does seem to give illusionism the benefit of the doubt and takes it more seriously. He claims that agreeing or disagreeing with the theory really depends on what you think about thought and mental representation. In analytic philosophy, the leading view is that thought and mental representation are separate from consciousness, which can make illusionism perfectly coherent, or not obviously incoherent. Although Goff argues that this idea comes from the wrong starting point, the external world, which he argues that the reality of conscious experience is more evident than the reality of the external world, and that there is an evident reality of consciousness. It is a much larger task arguing against Goff, however, as the debate would need to start with analysing whether thought and mental representation are distinct from consciousness, which would require much more thought. Perhaps the biggest challenge to the theory is one mentioned by Chalmers as the resistance problem and Kramer as the illusion meta-problem. Kramer claims that most philosophers admit that phenomenal consciousness is prima facie tension with physicalism. He thinks that it constitutes the hardest aspect of the illusion problem. While the illusion problem is the common recognised problem of explaining how the illusion of phenomenality arises, the illusion meta-problem focuses on the explanation of its peculiar strength. More precisely, it is the issue of explaining not only why phenomenal consciousness seems to exist, even though it does not. So why do we have this illusion of phenomenality? But why does it seem to be so peculiarly strong? Why is it so difficult to even entertain that phenomenality isn't an illusion? To illusionists, consciousness is a kind of introspective illusion. Kramer uses the idea of the Müller-Lyer illusion to show this. This is on the slide. It is evident that after some deliberation we can check this perceptual illusion. It is clear that we are misled by illusions. And furthermore, even when we recognise that it is a perceptual illusion, it does not disappear. But is this evidence that we can be misled by such a fundamental illusion of consciousness? One might suggest that illusionism seems so implausible simply because of our introspective disposition to believe that we are phenomenally consciousness is stronger than our perceptual dispositions to believe that such and such perceptual illusionary situations are real. But Kramer states the distinction between the illusion of phenomenality and other illusions is much more significant. The concern is that we cannot even simply entertain the situation described by illusionism about consciousness. What he calls the illusion meta-problem is the problem of explaining this unique difficulty we encounter when we try to think of the introspective appearance of phenomenality as an illusion. He states that none of the illusionist theories currently on the market are able to solve this problem, inclu including Frankish. The illusion meta-problem is connected to the notion that there is no appearance or reality distinction when it comes to consciousness which could explain why situations in where it appears to us that we are conscious when really we are not simply seem impossible. Kramer introduces the TCE theory to explain why this is so difficult. The TCE theory is that phenomenal introspection consists in the application of phenomenal concepts, which are theoretically determined concepts of epistemologically special states. If this theory is true, it solves the illusion meta-problem. The TCE theory is intended to be a theory of introspection of perceptual phenomenal states. Kramer quotes, These concepts are governed by our naive and modular theory of mind, which includes a naive theory of knowledge, that is, a naive 
epistemology. In this view, there is a tight link between the introspection of phenomenal states and our naive epistemology. This tight link is what accounts for the uniqueness of the illusion of phenomenality. He uses principles to show the naive theory of mind's modules take on phenomenal experience. So how does the TCE theory solve the illusion meta-problem? Kramer claims that if introspection really works as TCE theory suggests, then this has the consequence that, through introspection, we grasp experiences as entities that cannot introspectively appear in a non-vertical way. And this, in turn, solves the illusion meta-problem. He states that the theory predicts that our naive theory of mind implies that introspection is in a certain sense infallible and implies that experiences are self-imitating. This then explains why we cannot intuitively make sense of illusionism. It explains why we struggle to, so much as represent to ourselves in an intuitive fashion that consciousness seems to exist but does not exist. It also explains why illusionism in itself is neither contradictory nor incoherent at all. As long as we use a functional concept of its appearance, illusionism makes perfectly good sense. Frankish does well to describe illusionism and shows how it is distinguished from other similar theories and shows the types of illusionism. But to understand the theory further, however, it is integral to explore the criticisms first. When first reading about the theory, it did seem to be relatively incomprehensible and initially the criticisms cement this idea slightly further although Kramer introduces a relatively convincing argument for why this may be. Although Kramer's argument does not give a strong argument for illusionism as a whole, it provides an insight as to why it should be taken more seriously as a theory, rather than just dismissed by philosophers like Bloch. 